and a voice says, it was a car bomb. That moment every freedom fighter waits for, will they come for me today? And they'd come for me and I'd survived. Albi has been through the grinder and he speaks what he lives. Lying in bed recovering, I receive a note. Don't worry, Comrade Albi, we will avenge you. Avenge me? We're going to chop off the arms? We're going to blind people? Where's that going to get us? But if we get democracy in South Africa and freedom, that will be my soft vengeance. I say, phew. Yes, you can. <laughs> you can. We, we say the same, actually. What struck me uh, when we start the film, it's very interesting that you see, really, that the blown up of the car is filmed. And it was not a time when there were mobile phones or whatever. So I was really wondering, how did that come about? <laughs> well, we didn't arrange it. <laughs> <laughs> No, it, it was quite extraordinary because, um, I mean, I, I didn't know what was going on. You know, just boom, something terrible was happening, that I knew. And it turns out that was the public holiday and the Mozambican experimental television, it was called, was very close by. Okay. And a young African woman who happened to live in the same building that I was in, Irene was her name, uh, she got into the van with the camera person. They were driving past. She heard the explosion. She said, stop the van, stop the van. She got out. She said, film, film, film. She went through the crowd. She said, oh, my God, it's Albi. And then she said, carry the body into the van. There was a policeman there. He said, don't move the body. We have to wait for high authority to come. She said, carry the body into the van. She saved my life. Okay. It's the one part of the film I can't watch no. when I see my arm hanging down of course. and I, I close. But, um, and then she drove me straight to the Maputo Central Hospital, which is the main hospital quite nearby. At the same time, Dr. Eva Gurido was one of those I used to play bridge with. Every Saturday afternoon, I, I called it the remnants of the colonial bourgeoisie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we played bridge. And the conditions were you, no politics, no work, no complaints. You can just say, one no Trump, two clubs. You can gossip, you can talk about food or movies, but no politics. any event, Evo was a surgeon. He said he heard a terrible explosion. He went straight to the hospital. He just knew. He just knew there'd be casualties. And again, my body's wheeled in, and he says, oh, my God, it's Albi. Mm. And then his was the voice that I heard. You must look to the future with courage. Your arm is in a lamentable condition. And then I said into the darkness what happened, and I heard a woman's voice. It was the uh, anesthesiologist. She said it was a car bomb. And I fainted, but into joy. And, and people found that hard to understand. But it, it was a sense of total triumph. They had tried mm. to kill me that moment you're waiting for. Every day you go to sleep at night, you don't know will I get up the next day. I'm sure during the resistance in, in the Netherlands, people lived that same kind of mm -hmm. experience. And I'd only lost an arm. And I felt fantastic. And that was 88, and I still feel <laughs> fantastic. 
It's wonderful to be in a film museum and hearing that a filmmaker actually saved your life. So yes. I was also yes. wondering when I saw this movie that um, what is such a special thing in South Africa and also in the person Albie Sachs is that you chose to do the good thing in very bad circumstances. As the ANC, the, I, I guess the difficult thing was to choose for armed, uh, armed fight. Uh, so I was wondering how did the ANC feel about choosing to take on, on the arms in, you know, your, with your group of people? And how did it come about that you, at the end, chose also to be good in a bad uh, environment in the sense that you said, no, we can't use torture. We do have to write a good constitution. We have to strive for equality and not for black supremacy. Can you... Elaborate a little bit on that. Yes, for, for me it's so obvious that yes. <laughs> they all go okay. together, but that, that's with, with hindsight. Uh, basically, overwhelmingly, the ANC and the great majority of South Africans felt at last. At last be fighting back. Our leaders have been saying non-violence, non-violence, non-violence. Uh, I'm as close to being a pacifist by temperament at heart as you can get. At school I used to break up the fights. Uh, but I also felt at last we are fighting back mm. because we didn't have the vote, we didn't have rights, we couldn't even protest anymore. And it was submit or fight. And um, Mandela went underground, he got military training. You know, M Nelson Mandela is presented simply as Mr. Nice Guy, Mr. Nicest Guy mm -hmm. uh, in the whole world forever. Mm -hmm. He wasn't Mr. Nice Guy. He, he, he took up arms yeah. and um, he, he was willing to challenge and he represented the mood of the overwhelming majority of the people. Albert Lutuli was unhappy. He was a pacifist by conviction. Mm -hmm. But he said, if the people want it, I'm not going to stand in the way of that. Albert Lutuli was the president of the ANC who had won the Nobel Prize for Peace. So he went along with the whole process. Uh, Dennis Goldberg, we were mates at university. Um, and Dennis was very good with his hands. If we had a party in that youth organization, Dennis would do the loudspeaker and the lights. And I was good at talking. Yak, <laughs> yak, 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 yak. So Dennis ended up in Mkonto, where seas were in the armed struggle, 22 years in jail. I ended up talking, talking, talking. Um, <laughs> And in, in our own way, we both contributed. Um, it wasn't difficult taking the decision not to have torture because we were fighting for an ideal. Mm -mm. And once you simply fighting for power to destroy them, you're actually destroying the most precious thing you've got, which is your idealism, your sense of values, that thing that knits you together, that gives you courage, mm. that makes you feel you can put up with everything and anything because there's something special. It's not just power. It's not just advantage. It's not just to get somewhere. It's not even just to get rid of something terrible. And um, we were unanimous at that meeting. Oliver Tambo very strongly in favor of Joe Slover, Chris Harney very strongly in favor. The whole mainstream of the ANC felt we don't torture. We are freedom fighters. We don't use those methods. And, and else I love telling the story in the United States of America now. Yeah. Yeah. Still, can you imagine there's a debate in the United States today about whether it's permissible to use torture against Al-Qaeda, ISIS, whatever it might be. I mean, can you imagine? And we living in exile, living in camps, being bombed, subjected to all these things. We had no hesitation in saying no torture. And how did you deal with the fact that there were people within the ANC that, that at the end, even if the rule was there, they used torture or they did Well, it? people had used torture. So uh, very paradoxically, the reason why we got a truth commission in South Africa arose from that because we were about to have the first democratic elections and the national executive of the ANC was meeting. Very fierce, passionate debate because 
uh, we'd set up a commission to investigate. The commission had reported and said, yes, strong prima facie evidence that ANC security officials had tortured captured enemy agents, and we recommend appropriate action be taken against them. And now we're deciding what to do. We're going to have elections in a few months' time. And this is one of those issues you can't decide on a vote of hands. You, there's got to be a moral response. Mm. And some of us were saying, we set up the commission, and uh, we must follow through. And uh, Paolo Jordan, whom you saw in the film, mm. said, comrades, he has a high voice when he speaks. Some of you will, will know Paolo. Um, I've learned something today. There's a thing called regime torture, and that is bad, and there's ANC torture, that's okay. <laughs> Thanks for enlightening me. <laughs> and then people saying, you've got to understand the circumstances. These were 19, 20, 21 year olds, given up their studies. They knew nothing about police methods. They did to the captives what South African security did to them. That's what you do. And it would be wrong to punish them now. And then somebody stood up and said, what would my mother say? Now, the figure of my mother was often used in our debates. My mother was an African woman with maybe three or four years schooling. Not very knowledgeable about the world, but a strong sense of right and wrong. My mother would say there's something odd about this ANC. You are quite correctly examining your own failures, but what about all our people who were tortured, assassinated, the violence against us, where's the balance? And that's when Professor Kaida Asmal stood up and said, what we need is a truth commission. That's not just ANC, but the whole nation. Yeah, yeah. So ironically, our truth commission came about not to expose the crimes of apartheid, but so that we could come into the country with clean hands to examine our failures as well as the general failures. And that's, in a way, turning the bad into good. Uh, I don't know why I've, I've got into a confessional mode <laughs> lately. I'm as secular as you can get. <laughs> the ultimate product of the Enlightenment. <laughs> but I read the Bible when I was in solitary confinement. Okay. The only book I had was the Bible. I might say I found a lot of it very harsh, very tribalistic, smiting the enemies, destroying them one by one. I loved the Song of Songs, Solomon. And then the prophets, and then Isaiah. And Isaiah sang, the lion must lay down with the lamb, and we must turn swords into plowshares. And that's what we've been doing. Yeah. And you don't throw away the swords. You take that same metal, that's us, the same people, the same nation, and you refashion it, and you convert the negativity into positivity. And I think that's what's given us the energy to transform. So some of our high idealism came about through our repudiation of, the, of, our, of our own failures. But if we look from the outside to that process, I think we, we, we see it as a very South African story. I know that you're going to Colombia uh, and that you're trying to find out if a Truth and Reconciliation Committee will be uh, applicable to that situation with the FARC, etc. Do you think the Truth, Truth Committee was a very, only a very South African idea and concept and identity, if you want? Or do you think it can work outside South Africa and in different circumstances? I think there have been now about 35 Truth Commissions. Each one is different. What was unique in our case was the Truth Commission was linked with amnesty. If you came forward one by one, no. and acknowledge what you've done, you could get amnesty. That's not been done anywhere else and probably won't happen in Colombia. Uh, the Colombian government have asked me to, to go there and I think it will be part of the peace process with the FARC rebels mm. uh, and I think it can play an enormously important role. Uh, it might be a truth commission. It might be in Australia. They had an apology from the Labour Party government prime minister for the way that the Aboriginal people had been mm -hmm. treated. I don't know, in, in the Netherlands, has there ever been um, an investigation of 
Well, we have Indonesia, for example. No, we have a very, very <laughs> we have a very, very difficult attitude towards our history. I mean, with the colonization of Indonesia, of Suriname, but also with the Second World War. So um, uh, for us, it's it's a hard uh, hard to deal with that, with history and our own faults. Uh, so we can learn from from that process in South Africa, I think. Uh, and it says something, I think, about the country and its people also, in a way. So that's why I wondered if it, it was a sort of South African... Well, what uh, was special identity. was it went with that huge change. Hmm. It went with democracy. It went with President Mandela. It went with people voting for the first time. So it wasn't as though the Truth Commission had to somehow hold the whole world in its <laughs> hand uh, and, and transform the nation. Uh, it was part and parcel. Of course, we had marvelous leadership from, from Desmond Tutu. Yes. But it was a very diverse body that constituted the Truth Commission. And it's contested today. It's contested. It's um, 20 years old. Some people will say it let them off too lightly. You know, else what I found so interesting? Those of us who'd been through the mill, we favored the Truth Commission. We favored Amnesty for Truth. The yes. people from the human rights community who criticized apartheid but hadn't been in the struggle, mm -mm. they said, how can you let them off? It seemed paradoxical to me. Yeah, yeah. And if you look at that history of, if you want, if you see, in, which you said also in the documentary, uh, in South Africa you have really the bad apartheid and the good. I think also the constitution was, was really... Uh, a great piece of art almost because it, it was so forward-looking and so modern in a way if you looked also internationally but also the Truth and uh, Reconciliation Committee of course but if you look at that history and then at the current situation in, in, in South Africa I mean we hear here about uh, well the, the, the fighting with the migrants uh, and the racism that's coming up uh, how it, does it relate to that history is it a f is it a uh, a result of that, or is it something else? What, what is your view? I think we've got a fantastic country. This is the country we're fighting for. And we've got a very damaged society. It's not the society mm. we're mm. fighting for. And we're going to use the country. That means South Africa. That means the Constitution. It means elections, democracy, a lively press. It means a strong, vibrant cultural movement. Uh, it means an independent judiciary. Uh, it means people people feel free. They speak their minds. That's terrific. So we've got to use that to try and correct, you know, it, it's unemployment, there's still huge poverty, uh, racism is very strong uh, in, in all sorts of areas. Uh, there's corruption that's quite unacceptable. There are degrees of violence that's quite unacceptable. Uh, big questions about leadership and so on. Mm. But it doesn't mean we beat ourselves up because of those negative things. It doesn't mean we ignore them. But we draw on the positives and, and we draw on our strengths. We know each other from uh, 1999. I was director of the Prince Klaus Fund. It was just existing for two years, I think. And um, we worked with themes. And the theme we chose that year was uh, creating spaces of freedom. And uh, we asked Albi to uh, be a speaker at the ceremony of the Prince Klaus Awards. Um, and the beautiful thing then was that um, uh, you talked a lot about culture and arts and what it meant for society. It's extremely political. But it's not an instrument of politics. It, it gives meaning to politics, to life, to relationships. Uh, and and um, you can't separate art, law, human rights, art, creativity, music, uh, you know, where else? I, I can't imagine a wedding in the um, high court in, in Holland where the people come dancing in. <laughs> <laughs> and the people who are singing are the secretaries and, and the typists and the security people. Mm -hmm. right. um, so music is, is part of our life. And we, I know there is one court in, in the Netherlands that has those beautiful Marlene de Mar True. Tapestries. So yeah. there's that one point of correspondence, but it, it's um, our court is just filled with beautiful artwork, yeah. uh, and we feel it's. You wouldn't say you separate art and 
look at art simply in its own terms. Art is part of life. And to the extent that life involves people and human dignity and politics and conflict, art will deal with all those different things. Mm. So r really that, that was the, uh, our, our kind of thematic. Mm. The beautiful thing is that uh, you wrote a constitution, but you also built, well, not as an architect, but as a sort of coordinator, the, the constitutional court. And we saw uh, films uh, of that. And you also decided to, uh, that art should have a big part in that. Uh, so it has a collection now, and it's 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 part of that constitutional court. How did you manage that, and how did you choose that, and how did it come about? We had this huge advantage. The court didn't exist. We were a brand new court. As an institution, we didn't have a building. Mm. And so it meant we could invent ourselves. Normally, you enter an old building, legal building, what do you see? Pictures of dead white male judges. Now, one day I'm going to be a dead white male judge. So there's nothing wrong with that. But if that's all you see, that simple banal thing is saying only whites mattered, only men mattered. It's violating the whole spirit of our new constitution. And we could then decide what we should look like. And we used the theme of justice under a tree, okay. the traditional African way of settling disputes and to give that organic, transparent, open, participatory kind of a feel. In the event, at our very first meeting, we were sitting on borrowed chairs. We had nothing. Now, we had one chair. Okay. I know we had one chair because when Arthur Chaskelson, the Chief Justice, retired, his secretary said how terrifying it was sitting on the one chair the court had <laughs> with this tall figure circling round firing questions at her. And he dished out tasks. Ishmael Muhammad to do the rules of court. Kato Regan, a thing called computers, 94 were very new. <laughs> Laurie Ackerman, the library. Tolly Madala, the gown. And Yvonne Mohoro and I were the only two left. And Arthur said, decor. And he gave us the equivalent of 2,000 US dollars. Okay. But look what you can do. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> if it's the right time, if the arts community are involved, uh, and the architects are involved, um, and this is what we did. We decided we're not going to have the Magna Carta. I'm speaking in London in three weeks' time, okay. 800 years <laughs> of the Magna Carta, but we're not copying the Magna Carta. <laughs> we're not going to have the blindfolded woman. We fought for our own justice. Mm. We got our own building. It's our own constitution. We must have our own ambience and our own artwork by our own artists. Mm. But there's no denunciatory art, mm. because that's not right in a court. It's important in society. Mm -hmm. But no one should feel they come to court and the court's made up its mind that exactly. we had some beautiful, beautiful feminist art by Diane Victor. Mm. We said we can't, because we have so many cases dealing with patriarchy and sexism. Mm. And if we have images in the court that already show a slant, a position, then, then people would feel uh, it's a waste of time mm. coming here. Mm. But great diversity of mm. styles mm. Uh, from Marlene, who's internationally famous. Yeah. We have actually, I wonder if we can show yeah. the, uh, that's, uh, that's William Kentridge. If nobody's seen him nude before. <laughs> Dumili Feni. Yes. Dumili was important. Dumili showed William the power of black and white. William was studying at the Johannesburg Art Center and he saw Demille's drawings and he decided to develop that genre and now of course it's that most amazing, wonderful artwork that, that we saw uh, in, in, in the yeah. Amsterdam Eye. Uh, that, that's another South African connection. I wonder if we can show yeah. the, uh, the three-headed dog. Yeah. That, that was used by the Handspring Puppet Company some of you might have seen the war horse. I don't know if it's come to the Netherlands. Yes. With these yeah. amazing puppets. And I just learned two weeks ago that, that Adrian and the other guy were actually helping our underground resistance oh. uh, in Botswana in the 1980s. Okay. I always felt there was something special about mm. them. You know, mm. other than that they were great uh, artists. Mm. In any event, uh, William worked with them on the, the figures, and the three-headed dog, Uber and the Truth Commission, uh, for that play, he was looking for a body. 
And he found this little satchel, this bag, leather bag, which his father, uh, Sidney Kentridge, had left behind in Johannesburg when Sidney went to practice in, in London. Mm. And he thought, great. So we also thought, great, you know, Sidney Kentridge, the great lawyer in South Africa, that bag is now part of that art object that's in the court, and they donated it to us. And I used to go to Sydney for breakfast when I'm in London, and he said, oh, you know the story of that bag? So I said, yes, you left it behind. He said the bag was given to him by uh, Bram Fischer, who was really one of our great heroes, uh, head of the Bar Council in Johannesburg, a brilliant lawyer. He would appear for the Chamber of Mines and he would appear for workers. Mm -hmm. Everybody loved him, but he was working secretly in the underground, in, in the Communist mm -hmm. Party. And he died after 10 years in prison. He was carried out almost mm -hmm. lifeless. His ashes were scattered afterwards. No one knows where they were. And Sidney Kentridge had been the junior working with Bram Fischer in a case, and Brahm had given him that bag. And I thought that was the end of the story. But then Sidney told me the case in which uh, Sidney had appeared as junior to Brahm Fischer was the case of Sachs versus Furtrecker Pers. Mm. Sachs was my dad, Solly yes. Sachs. And Furtrecker Pers had been defaming him, and that was why Sidney was working with Brahm and why he got that bag in that particular case. And now I'm head of the Arts Committee in the Constitutional yes. Court. I know nothing about that. I just see it's a yeah. marvelous work. But that sense of connection and history, yeah. and it goes back even further because Sidney Kentridge's father, that's William's grandfather, mm -hmm. was locked up in the labor struggles oh. in the number four prison where the court is today. That's... Wonderful story, actually. Well, that's the mixture of yeah. art, human rights, struggle, Law, passion, belief, yeah. uh, feeding together, not in the minds of some uh, aesthetic critic, but in our history, exactly. which we discover afterwards. Yeah. Okay, thank you to Albie Sachs.